I became an artist years ago. I was, I was living in Washington D.C. and uh, I, was, I was painting houses in the summertime with this guy. I was his apprentice, and I walked into this one person's apartment that I had to paint because that was my job to go in and extract mm -hmm. uh, the problem and cover it up with paint, whatever. So I walked into an artist studio. It was the first time I'd ever done it. How old were you? I was 19. 19. Or 18. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was like walking into a sanctity. Mm -hmm. It was like a July day in Washington, D.C. It was very humid. It was 6 a.m. And I opened the door, and the shades were pulled down. And you could see the light trying to break in behind the shades, and the sound of air conditioning, and the cool air, and the smell of linseed oil and turpentine. Mm -hmm. The pins were flying. And the pins were all in shadow. And I turned mm -hmm. on the light. Turn it back off because it was just, just, mm -hmm. just this beautiful feeling in this room. I still tingle when I tell the story. Mm -hmm. I said, "Wow, what goes on in here?" You know, and I was like, "This is wild." I forgot I had to paint this this thing in there, right? So I put it back out, and I I wanted to know who was responsible for making me feel that way. So I and for a whole week I would go out go to that that floor and stake out that that apartment. And I never found out who was responsible for that. Mail. This was an artist's work? It was an artist and it was you an never artist found studio. Out who the artist no. Was. I didn't even look at the work. I just thought the vibe. Yeah. Wow. It was the vibe. Mm -hmm. So then I said, well, I, don't, I want to know how to do that. I want to know how to make people feel this way. Mm -hmm. So I, I pursued, I went to the Corcoran and I took a summer class to get a portfolio together so I could then apply to art school. Mm -hmm. But when I was in the studio uh, with the instructor, I, I, I happened to be lucky because I said, hi, I was talking to this woman named Rona Slade. I said, hi, you know, I, I'm trying to get my portfolio together so I can apply to this school. And she says, uh, you're very good. You go upstairs and you tell Tim Gunn that you're in the school. I said, who, who the hell are you? She said, I'm Rona Slade. I'm the director. I said, oh God, all right. <laughs> I went upstairs, I said, Tim Gunn, I'm in the school. Rona said so. I was in. And I didn't know how difficult it was. Yeah. And that, this is that, the corporate. The corporate. Right, right, so right. that year, I'm talking to these kids, you know, they're all like coming in, like trembling. I said, oh, how did you get in? How was your interview? I'm like, interview? What are you talking about? <laughs> well, we drove in for miles, and we, yeah, my right. father was still, you know, sweating. And I said, no, nah, man, just, they told me to come in. I consider myself, uh, uh, I draw a lot, and I think of a line as something that ins inspires me. So I try to use the line that uh, I've discovered, which is rubber. And I used to use rope, tape, and in various types of masking tape, you have various thickness and widths of line. And I used to make these drawings out of tape, two inch line, one inch line, and I would pull the tape and make the line and do all these things. Eventually, I moved into just exploring other forms of making mine. And now it's rubber. So, uh, Greg, tell us about the show Strut. The show Strut is basically a premise that I had come up with because, uh, again, we were talking about uh, how artists have shows and they come up with titles and they sort of come and go. And I, I thought I would work on a series, uh, have a body of work. I thought that I would have a series that would become my, my sort of theme, and I think I'll do strut for maybe another five years, but uh, it's about uh, double word. Uh, strut is, is a figurative uh, slang term which indicates a kind of urban walk, and then it also has an implication that means to support something. So the physical support of the sculpture resembles struts, and then the, the, the gesture or the, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, the attitude is strutting. So it's like, look at me, that's the attitude of the work. And that's why the title. I always feel that in the artists, we, uh, I live in New York, and I always feel that there's a lot of subculture that I go through. I used to work at a bar. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of musicians. I, I, I have a friend who's a photographer. He DJs Fashion Week, and I go look at the models and how they present themselves. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of different people who do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you're living in New York, you have two or three jobs sometimes. Mm -hmm. So strut became a kind of a fashion hybrid, a lifestyle hybrid. And I wanted to like integrate more of the other worlds rather than let the other worlds look for me. I want to embrace the other worlds. So it's kind of a fashion issue. And I, I created uh, t-shirts so that it would be somewhat considered like 
glamour, and it's, a, it's just my attempt at trying to merge my art more into the world rather than have the world seek me out. I'm trying to merge more into the art, into the non-art world. What are your ideas about black art? Do you consider yourself a black artist or uh, artist who happens to be black? Um, the difference would be an artist, a black artist, in my my definition of it would be a person who's black who to, who creates art based on a historical narrative mm -hmm. of a black the black race mm -hmm. and in that historical narrative there's usually a depiction of slavery and the subjugation of the black person mm -hmm. by white people. Mm -hmm. I have the other definition of an artist who happens to be black is a person who has the world view, mm -hmm. who has been who grew up in a black three-day black home or whatever. Mm -hmm and takes on the worldview of moving forward in, in, in life, embracing all the things that are in this world, not just the, the baggage of, uh, of slavery, but the, the forward thinking of possibilities and taking risks on different issues. So I, I do think there are two different types. I do think that there are people who make money because um, the, the mainstream culture in this country is white, 80% of the population. And so minority cultures tend to pander to the, the, the ruling class because they have to, to make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's part of the problem, I think. I don't hold anyone responsible and say anyone's bad for that. I just mm -hmm. see that and make an observation. Mm -hmm. And so I choose not to make art to pander to the ruling class. I try to make art that, 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 that I like for myself. You don't know how many people you affect by being you know, a good person or a caring person and how much you liberate people by showing your work to people. You know, you don't know who you affect. So I had gotten into like being an artist. Yeah, you know, artist. Then I realized like, fuck it, you know, I'll just, I'll just be an artist. So my ego took over and now I'm trying to like lose it and just get back into this vibe. Yeah. What, what is that vibe? Can you describe it? The vibe is the vibe that says you can be inspired just by someone being inspirational, mm -hmm. you know, and not being dogmatic and preaching and having an agenda. For me, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Just, just you walk into the room and you see something. Say, "Wow, that's really good," and you just feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I think a lot of times I used to get into being very preachy. You know? I was a big German expressionist fan. I would make a lot of paintings about. Homeless, the human condition, homelessness, crack holes, living in these bad, rough neighborhoods in Williamsburg. I would do these paintings about prostitutes and try to bring to light the ills of our society. And I would have shows and nightclubs and bars, try to bring to light, you know, the man's inhumanity to man. You know, people just drank and didn't give a damn. So. <laughs> I changed that. I'm real curious about this notion of political art. See, I, I, I believe that all art is political. Like, Halina Pendel has a show right now, George Nandis, and she's got these paintings that talk about George Bush and how he's a liar and all this. I'm like, yeah, no, that's, no, that's not news. Mm -hmm. You know, I've read the New York Times, I've seen that. You know, you didn't crack that story, yeah. you know? The Abu Ghraib story, you didn't crack it? That's old, you're just right. telling me something I already know. Yeah. That's not political, but they she had got a big review in the Times and how political it is. No, that's not political. Political I am, because I can do what the hell I want. And that's why it's political. Because I have freedom to do what I want. I'm not trying to rely on reactionary issues. And, and like, for instance, I think that's reactionary. When you, you know, people give these so-called uh, art, people who make themselves political artists, they, they do reactionary issues. They're not investigative reporters. I mean, those people are political. I mean, someone goes and cracks a story that could cost them their life, mm -hmm. or goes into a war and brings back the truth. I mean, that's political. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm political because I'm free to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's, that's as far as I can go and say, mm -hmm. as far as I should say I'm political, that's all. Mm -hmm. But um, art today, uh, I like art. I love art. I love looking at it and talking to artists, and I love looking at Things. I, I'm, I'm a little upset at star fuckers, you know, people who, in our society who only want to show the established group of people that they feel represent all of our thoughts and, and, and desires, and that's not possible. 
I lost my term. Well, yeah, I <laughs> picked it up from one of my subcultures. What types of people are the star fuckers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they want to be on the winning team. You know, it's like you can say. Um, it's like um, everyone has a good idea. You know, not one person has has got all of the good ideas. I mean, for instance, Ross Collector, I, I like him. He's nice. He's, he, he he can hit sometimes with the painting, but he's not great. You know, I'm not great. I mean, I can hit it now and then. You know, I mean, it's like you have a franchise. Once you have a franchise, people cannot afford to let you go. Mike Tyson is a franchise. He he, he can rape women and do all kinds of criminal acts, but he's a franchise. In other words, he makes other people money. So once you get a franchise together where you're, the other people are responsible, you're responsible for their income, you're never going to you know, go out of vogue. So we have that in this country where you have all these different people who, who become franchises. You know, and then they lock into this and nothing can stop them from existing. David Bowie is a franchise. I can't stand David Bowie, but he's never going to go away. Elton John, never going to go away. <laughs> so our job is to somehow to try to sub, 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 subvert the franchise and get in and say, hi, entertain, uh, you know, originality is here, ideas are here too, you know. It's like, like universities don't have a, uh, they have a franchise on art. Yale, everyone wants to go to Yale for art. Look, this school can, can produce artists. They have an art department. They got, they got integrity. So that's, that's the thing I'm, I'm against, and that's what's happening in art. There's too many franchises and too many people blocking other people's advancement. So, I mean, Charles Searles is a painter from Philadelphia. He died of lung cancer. Yes. Sir. I think uh, two years ago. I think. Yeah. And we went to uh, Charles's thing at the Henry Street Settlement, and we were in. I was in the audience with Earl Williams, and we were like fucking around. And I said, "Yeah, man, I wonder who's next." Mm -hmm. And Al Loving was supposed to give a, um, a eulogy, mm -hmm. and he had laryngitis. Mm -hmm. Thought anything about it. Mm. Later on, it turns out that that was a polyp uh -huh. on his throat. He also had lung cancer, oh, wow. and then he died. Mm. So both of them died suddenly. Mm. So I, I, I got being very affected by the loss of people who you get used to talking to. Mm. You know, who you talk to, you, you trust, and you enjoy, and all the things you, you see as life goes on. Mm. And I started thinking, you know, wow, man, you know, it's over like that. So I became very uh, emotional about how should I be remembered. When you're gone, your art talks for you. And uh, how do you want that to say? What do you want it to say? And like, you know, Al is gone, and I'm conscious of it. I'm very conscious of Charles's absence and the, those things. Well, then I guess the the question is, what do you want your art to say in your absence? I wanted to say um, he took a lot of risk, and he had some very nice ideas once in a while, and. Uh, he was very kind to a lot of people.